Hello, welcome to KCPCM Youth Worship. Let us pray before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this great and wonderful day to worship. Uh, let us be present in your worship and uh, let Pastor Peter's sermon impact our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> fear is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here 
The atmosphere, the atmosphere is changing now. For the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the spirit. with you. The Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all. Give us for all the sinful actions we have committed in front of your eyes during this past week. We are weak without you, so please lend us your hand and lead us to the right path to enter the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hello, good to see you guys on a Sunday morning. Welcome back. Uh, today, in continuation uh, from where we left off last week, chapter 11, we would like to look at the latter part, verses 19 through 26. 
according to our gospel project. Last week, I got a manila envelope returned to me from post office. And for some reason, either I uh, mistakenly not put on a, a label there or maybe in the process of getting shipped, uh, the address fell um, off of the envelope. So if for any reason you didn't get the, the gospel project booklet for this season, please let me know um, using the email address underneath or talk to your small group leader and ask for one. I will ship it at, uh, as quickly as possible. Now, having said that, we're going to go back to our passage, which comes from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. Let me read this out to you. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to witness the first very official missionary dispatched to church, in Antioch, uh, Lord, we want to turn to you like Barnabas, an exemplary model, a good person, a person filled with faith. As we look to you and as you look at the ancestors of our faith, the good exemplary models which we turn to in the Bible, may we learn from them as you transform us, as you present the truth to us, Lord. Help us to gaze our eyes upon your truth, your grace. It was poured upon us on that cross so that our lives may also change, that we may also come to see the fruition of our work, our toil and labor as we build your church here, Lord. So at this time, more than anything, we ask that the Holy Spirit who presides, that you would come and speak to us individually in the context where we lie, in the, the lives and the, and the experiences that we uh, individually go through that you would speak to us in a very customized way as in a very personal and a personable way that you speak to us at this time so lord use my lips uh, to speak your message so that you may transform us we thank you lord in the name of jesus christ we pray amen so last week we looked at peter just having this gordon ramsay moment like no i'm not gonna eat that no bring it you know Bring it back to the kitchen. Bring it back to the shelf. And God was just kept sending this food uh, in his trance, showing that now his ministry is about to expand from the rejection of the Israelites. Now he wants to share the gospel. He's opening the doors to Gentiles like people like us so that we can build churches in Korea, in Japan, in India, in, in America, and so on and so forth. And this is where we are. From this very first official missionary dispatch of, um, of the Jerusalem church or the Jerusalem council sounding Barnabas. And we wonder why they sent out Barnabas. Because he was a good man. Because this is a man of peace. As we look at a lot of uh, other accounts of Barnabas um, working with other people, um, we want to look at how he pivoted around the work of Jesus and the gospel. And from him and his characteristics and the fruits of his life, we want to look at him, we want to model him, we want to learn from it, if that was even possible. And uh, let's look at the backdrop of today's passage, what's going on, and uh, let's look at, in a more um, special way, try to look at it um, in, a, in a topical way, to look at the life of Barnabas and try to capture some of the moments where it shows his true characters and and, and hopefully you know we we are we admire it and hopefully god 
um, blessing us and, and leading us that we become more and more like him. Um, so let's see what's going on. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. I mean, gee, I wish that God would look at my life, that on my deathbed and as I meet him, that God would look at me and give the same kind of compliments and say, hey, this was a good man. He lived a good life, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And may that be the case for all of us. May God uh, bless us. So there's a church now that is growing in Antioch. Now, the majority of the people that were dispersed because of the persecution, and at this time, Saul was one of the, the persecutors at the very forefront. And f I, if not directly or indirectly, he was at the event when um, Deacon Stephen, another faithful man, man filled with the Holy Spirit, was getting stoned and he witnesses his death as he's watching the clothes of the people uh, that were throwing stones at him and he was so enraged that he was on his way to Damascus and he encounters Jesus and from that point he becomes uh, one of the prominent disciples or the prominent apostles himself and we're seeing how the development the diaspora church growing in other uh, Gentile areas other than Jerusalem. This is God's will. Through persecution, through evil, through bad, God is actually doing good. And we're seeing the fruits of the good um, actually springing out from those events. And now the Jerusalem Council, which is kind of like the, the headquarter of this first Christian church, they feel, I think it's, you know, we can interpret it two ways. One is they want to check out the Gentile church and to see if they have the legitimate doctrines, but more so to encourage them and to send someone like Barnabas, who is known to be the son of encourager, the son of exhorter. You know, we see a lot of these movies, these one word, one turn movies, with, you know, the equalizer, or the Punisher and Barnabas isn't really his name this man this character he had such a strong uh, trait uh, such as a strong Christian character as an encourager that the people instead of calling him his, by his original name Joseph they called him encourager right then wouldn't that be called the son of encourager that whenever you walk in like people say hey look at that guy the, the son of encourager is here like everybody's encouraged just by looking at this person walking into the room so that was the kind of influence that he had that was a kind of you know personal history uh, that he had and no wonder no other than uh, Barnabas Jerusalem council sends him to do the work of encouraging this uh, very early Gentile church and along the way, what does this good man full of the Holy Spirit do? He brings Saul from Tarsus. So by this time, um, you know, he, he had built a relationship with Saul. And Saul is the, the academic type. He's very, um, he's very passionate. He's very, you know, he's, he's, uh, he has the... Um, he has the energy to go to these different places, but also he has a very strong um, uh, mental power, and he's academically very rigorous that he's studying. So Barnabas uses Saul. He invites him to this ministry to teach the doctrines, to uh, evangelize the Gentiles and continue on the work of building this church. So verse 25, 23, 26, this is what's happening. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, and there the disciples are first called Christians, bearing the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's some event. We see that there is Jews on one side and there's Gentile on one side. But we see a mediator like Barnabas who's going into there to unify these churches together. That there is no dualism from his perspective. This man is a man of peace who unifies. And I think that's what, how we ought to see our church as well. You know, uh, we uh, distinctively have EM youth and KM youth. But this is how we ought to look at one another. Even though we're in a different culture, we use a different language. Ultimately, we are one church. And we need more people like Barnabas where we can mediate, where we can bring one another, encourage one another, and try to connect one another to do the work of God in unity. But anyway, let's go back to passage. So who is this Barnabas? I mean, I don't think God is telling us to look at Barnabas and try to guilt trip us and say, see, look at Barnabas. You want to be like him. 
Because if you were to try to follow as we track down the things that he did, which we will do right now, and try to do all these things as we come out to church, to our Bible studies, I think we're, everyone's going to be more discouraged and encouraged as we try to force ourselves to be like a saint uh, who's been complimented in so many good ways and like we look at all these events so who is Barnabas I think God wants to, us to look at Barnabas and admire him uh, more than feel discouraged that we're not we're nothing like him you know I, I feel discouraged in a sense because I'm nothing like Barnabas I'm very selfish like this guy is a is a generous guy he seems to be like in all these dif difficult places and doing all the difficult tasks and there is no uh, you know recollection of him there is no uh, recording of him complaining about the situation or rejecting to do a hard task that is given to him. What did he do when he first met Saul? He heard about Saul, a lot of bad things. And people were saying, like Saul, did he really convert as he met um, Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus to persecute church? What did Barnabas do? We're looking at... Um, his life pivoting around Jesus Christ. We're looking at some of the characters by serving some of the events. What did he do? It says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, we're referring to Saul, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Everybody by this time when they hear about Saul and like, oh, this guy's he's double playing. He's like a spy. He's going to kill us. This is one of his very sophisticated tactics. Stay away from this guy. And Barnabas, he stands up for Saul. He defends him and was the influence and the, the name that he has. He says, you know, I put my name for this guy. I trust this guy. You know, trust me. He's a good guy. He's now one of us. And that's how he ultimately, how he brings Saul, who later becomes Paul, into this ministry, who later becomes a prominent teacher who writes multiple epistles, multiple um, uh, epistles in the New Testament, uh, which builds a foundation for the church. So that is Barnabas. Barnabas was a man who was full of the spirit of, of encouraging. He's a man who trusts. The man who says, you know, let's give him another chance. He was a mediator. He practiced love. And we look at another account where later Paul and so Saul turning Paul, Paul and Barnabas, they go on their very first missionary trip and they bring John Mark. And this is what happens. And verse, uh, it says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark with him, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. So they're on their way to do this missionary uh, trip. And as for some of you that went on a missions trip, like even on a short term, you know how hard it is, right? Sometimes you don't get the shower. Sometimes you, you miss your mama's recipe. You don't, you know, get a, you have to share a bunk bed with somebody. And it's just very, very inconvenient. And can you imagine having to do a long-term missionary uh, in the Greco-Roman world where there was no motel, there was no hotel, there was no uh, missionary that was hosting at the site just giving us the directions to, oh, you know, from 9 to 12 you're going to be doing VBS, you know, and then we're going to be serving you lunch. And, you know, the locals are going to come and serve you. And then 1 p.m. we're going to go to this church and school and we're going to do, you know, other stuff, teach them English and stuff. No, it wasn't like that. There was no fixed itinerary. You don't know what kind of threats uh, were waiting there. If you got sick, you didn't have a first aid supply. And Mark John, uh, apparently he was, you know, perhaps from a, uh, from a uh, financially well-established um, house, he had a hard time. And he said, you know what, I feel like I need to go home. This is, this is too much for me, Apostle Paul. Can I go home, please? And he got, this triggered Paul. Paul got really mad. And Barnabas was like, yeah, it's okay, you can go home. 
And then later when they were going on a missions uh, trip again, Barnabas being the encouraging person as he is, he talks to Paul. And you know what? You know that guy who failed last time? Let's bring him wisdom for the second trip. You know, let's, let's uh, give him that experience of a successful mission trip. You know, he must have lost a lot of confidence. Let's bring him back in. Let's teach him a, little, a thing or two. And guess what? Paul says no. Uh, you know, he's, he's very rigid. He's, he's very, you know, he's, a, he's got a powerful character. And this um, actually makes them depart from one another where Paul goes his way and Barnabas goes with his way and later when we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 11 we find out that this work of encouragement of Barnabas it actually changes it transforms uh, the John Mark but also how Paul evaluates him so this is the power from this characteristic this encouraging characteristics that Barnabas has. Everywhere he goes, he encourages, he exhorts, he builds, he unites, he converts, he trusts, he forgives. And this is how Paul writes to Timothy in chapter, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 11. As he's writing, he says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Wow. That is the work of Barnabas. I wish there were a lot of Barnabas. I wish I could be like Barnabas. But I can't. How can you be like this guy? No matter how much we try to be like him, we're only going to see the pileup of, of multiple failing events. Let me ask you a question. As I was contemplating on this passage, what is the most difficult thing uh, to do at work. What was the most difficult experience that you had to go through in a school? I know you guys are in high school and, and junior high, so maybe some of you have not had this kind of experience. But for me, uh, going through high school and college, the most difficult task was not having to do a math quiz or having to memorize, you know, books after books to fill in the gaps and write an essay or to even do a presentation, even though I hated presentations. I hated making PowerPoints and I hated doing presentations. But guess what? The most important task at school, which I've experienced, was this team project. How many of you can agree with that? Team project is the most difficult task that a student can, can experience in their in their journey, in their educational journey. Why? Because like there's a deadline, but then you have to designate these roles out of a group of four or five people uh, where except for one, you know, straight A guy, we all happen to be the worst procrastinators. I'm talking about myself, by the way. And yet you got to somehow designate roles and you got to give each one of uh, them tasks with people diff with different characteristics and people just procrastinating, not wanting to do their job. And somehow you got to have a singular, a unified theme to be able to present it and somehow get a good grade for that. And it seems like every time for most people, uh, whoever participates in this, uh, this uh, group project, you end up with a pretty bad score. And you kind of know that it's coming. And you go, oh, okay, <laughs> now that was that guy. And perhaps it's the feelings are mutual. <laughs> people don't want to work with you. You don't work with other people. Working with other people is hard. And having to do something and produce and do something constructive with someone that you don't know and with someone who have characteristics, uh, character clashes, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's impossible <laughs> at times, it seems. But what do we learn from here? Barnabas, the encourager, we want to be like him. This is how church grows. This is how new people group come to know the gospel. This is how people experience love through people that are so-called the Christians like Barnabas. And, and the more I look at Barnabas and as I compare my own experience and my own traits and characteristics, I just find uh, that I'm doomed because I'm not going to be like him. I'm not like him, not anything like him after more than a decade of ministering. So what is it? What is it? What's the difference between Barnabas and I and for perhaps for many of us 
hearing this message. It's perhaps this. It's perhaps he found the treasure. Quoting from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his, uh, and, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. He perhaps found the truth. He perhaps found the value of the gospel. I think this is the case. Is that this encourager was known originally as Joseph found Jesus Christ. And he found the value of the kingdom as he anticipated on meeting Jesus once again. And he, as he saw the value of it. Any of the value here on earth compared to the value that was to come later in the future was just incomparable. It was just nothing. And that's why he was just giving and giving and giving. Remember the first act, I think it was in like chapter 4, as the church was building up, this encouraging man came and he gave his whole estate. He sold his whole estate and gave it to the church so that the ministry of the church can go on. And we saw Ananias and Sapphira who tried to kind of kind of replicate that or try to imitate that and only to fail. And that's what happens. When we try to force ourselves to do the moral things and to do the good things without actually grasping the truth, like in the first part of chapter 11, we have misconceptions. We end up with misinterpretations. And we end up like Ananias and Sapphira. We're trying to do good work, but without grasping Jesus Christ and holding it was dear valley, was, was dear um, passion. There's no way that we can become like Barnabas. Uh, there is a scandal uh, that is developing in Korea right now. I don't know if you've heard, which uh, surrounds uh, this company called Korea Land and Housing Corporation. It's not a private company, it's a public sector. So basically this is what, is, what, what happened. The employees of this LH, in short, so they basically know where the government plannings are headed in the near future, in the long-term future, where the government will implement and build uh, in, in various sites. So they have the intel, the information on once where the government starts building constructions that whoever owned those properties or those land at the time, they will be financially heavily remunerated. So someone who owned the land which cost about $100, the government will repay them with $300, $500, $1,000. So guess what they did? You know, they did what, <laughs> what any of us would do only on the premise knowing that they, and hoping that they would not get caught, they told all their families to buy that land. The government's going to start building things in two years and three years, and the price of that land is going to rise. So go buy it. And they told everyone. And guess what? Now, there's this interesting uh, thing where uh, per each tree that is planted in the land, you get extra additional. And depending on the types of the tree, if it's like a a more expensive type, then you get even more money. And now this has become a great scandal back in Korea. And, and there's just so many people that has corroborated, that have corroborated and uh, are involved in it. And it's become a huge, huge issue. And guess what? That's, that's like what it is. You've got the intel, right? The Bitcoins hit 60K just uh, about a day or two ago. And people all in hindsight think, like, only if I knew when Bitcoin was only $1, knowing that it would turn into a 60K fortune, I'd have put all my money in there. I've sold my laptop, sold my trousers, sold, my, sold even my pet, you know, sold everything in the refrigerator so that I can get hold of these Bitcoins. And just like that, when we know the value and, and how it's going to turn out, we would give everything, we would put everything, we would put our life into it. And that's what we see in the life of Barnabas. The money, the estate, which could give him pleasure and, and fame and, and good life and, and leisurely life here on earth for the next, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, 
compared to what was to come through Jesus Christ and all eternity's perspective, it was nothing. So he could give. He could forgive and forget. And same goes for the Zebedees in Matthew chapter 4. As they saw Jesus, the rabbi, coming to them. And people misinterpret this, I think, in, in, in a wrong way. Um, as these two Zebedees, they're fishing with their father. And Jesus comes to them and says, hey, follow me. And here goes, verse 21 and verse 22. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat. Was their father Zebedee mending their nets? Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed. And people go, wow, the Zebedees. Look, they abandoned their father. They abandoned their, their livelihood, their boat, their business, and they followed Jesus Christ. Wow, what a sacrifice. You know, let's give him an applause. But really, what it meant culturally in that context to follow a rabbi was, to, was an honorable thing. It was the most honorable thing that a man can, can become in the context of uh, the first Palestinian, the Jewish life and their culture. Right? That's why right, Zacchaeus was waiting on the top of the sycamore tree. He climbed the sycamore tree and he saw Jesus. And when he encountered Jesus, what happened? This stingy, big bad bully boy Zacchaeus all of a sudden he turns and says Jesus whoever I've wronged I'm going to repay them four times this stingy guy nothing has changed he's still a stingy guy he's still a frugal guy but he says I'm going to pay them repay them by four times because he has met Jesus Christ and this is what happens so we don't want to look at these events we don't want to look at the things that Barnabas did and try to imitate them. But we want to get into the core and want to see the man and the transformation and hope that God would do the same here, that, that God would do the same for you and for me moving forward, that as we are touched by the Holy Spirit, as we grasp and grasp the kingdom, as we learn more and more about Jesus Christ, that as you grasp the value of the kingdom, that we become generous, that we become more forgiving, that we become more like Jesus Christ because we see the value of the treasure that is hidden in the land, that we want to sell everything that we have in our possession, that we may have something to do with Jesus Christ, that we may have part with Jesus Christ, that we may have part with the gospel, that when we meet Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will say, wow, you're a good person, filled with the Holy Spirit. You did very well, good job. And there will be no regret there. There will be praise. There will be joy. So let me read this out to you. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. May this be the case for myself and for you all and for this church. As we grow together, as we continue to build upon the foundation of the personable, the wonderful Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for showing us the life of Barnabas, a transformation which took place through the work of the Holy Spirit as he grasped the truth, as his life pivoted around Jesus Christ and the gospel. We see numerous events, the numerous uh, and recollection of this wonderful man doing wonderful things. Lord, the task which is put into our hands in this era, how can we replicate that? It is, I think, only by us encountering you, Jesus Christ, at a personal level. I think it's only through your work of the Holy Spirit which will enable us, which will uh, make us capable of doing such great things. So, Lord, I ask that as we come to read your Bible, as we come to pray, that the Holy Spirit, that you would work in the same effective way as to changing our characters like Barnabas, that you would turn us all into encouragers in our very own context, in our families, in our ministries, at our school, that we would all be encouraging characters and just serving uh, the community around us. So, Lord, may this be uh, the will of Christ for us. We thank you, Lord, for this message. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
as we desire more of you, Jesus Christ, as we admire Barnabas, his life, and his legacy, we plead with you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and work in the same powerful way that through your church today, as your church rises, that you would also serve the community around us. There's so much division. There's so much isolation and prejudices, misconceptions, misunderstandings, so much hatred. But Lord, turn us into mediators. Turn us into people of peace. That we learn from the ultimate source of peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that we would become a church that carries, that performs, that delivers the gospel in a way that you have intended for us to deliver. So Lord, a task entrusted in our hand, it is so precious and so significant. Give us the power, tell us the truth, reveal us the kingdom that we may desire to continue to build your church upon the blood of our forefathers. And because we are thankful for what you are ultimately doing here, we give our offering to you, Lord, that you may continue to advance your ministry, that you may continue to spread your gospel through the communities around us. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon your church forever and ever. Amen.